Hey there, Canadian Wealth Secret Seekers. Today, we are going to be digging into a secret sauce episode that's all focused on something we all tend to finance and essentially waste our money on, and that is cars. Uh, you, if you've been listening for a while, you know that I'm not a massive fan about uh, of cars. I like cars. I think they're great. I think they look awesome. Uh, some of them are very nice and better than others, but boy, oh boy, do I dislike paying for them and watching their value decrease each and every day. Well, I understand that in today's modern society that most need a car unless they are in urban centers with great transportation. So we are going to talk about that thing, the car, okay? And for a lot of people, they really enjoy that car. It's something that they, you know, feel like they've earned, and I'm not going to take that away from anyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the different ways that we can finance vehicles. We're going to look at some options that have been, you know, maybe touted out there as maybe good options or better options. And we're going to really try to see and get the rubber to hit the road, pun intended, on how we might go about financing vehicles and how maybe you might shift your thinking a little bit after today's episode with some of the ideas that I'm going to share. So we're going to dig in here first and foremost. Now, for those who are hanging out with me you know, on uh, YouTube, you folks get a little bit of a better glimpse here. I'm going to be sharing some screens and sharing some numbers as well. But the first thing that I want to do, I'm going to share a website from Ramsey Solutions. So that's Dave Ramsey and Friends. And uh, I just want to highlight that, you know, there's some things about car depreciation you may or may not know, but ultimately, as soon as you drive it off the lot, uh, it's supposed to go down in value by about 9%. They go on in this article here to say that actually in the first year, you can expect the average new vehicle to depreciate by about 20%, and then 15% after that for years two, three, four, and five. So that's not so hot. However, the reality is, is that, hey, we need to finance cars. And next, I want to turn to the idea of buying a new car and talking about some of the financing deals you might see. So for example, when you buy a new car, oftentimes there's incentives. And one of those incentives could be 0% financing or maybe 1.9% financing or whatever the number is. The reality is, is that there's usually another option there. So you have to be cautious here. When you think you're doing 0% financing, oftentimes you're looking at a vehicle and the price of the vehicle is going to be dictated by whether you take that low interest rate option or not. So let's think about a 0% financing option here. If you take 0% financing, that's your incentive for, let's say, $80,000 vehicle. Nowadays, it seems like more and more vehicles are approaching 100000 and beyond. Uh, if they're a really nice vehicle, you can get that 0%. But if you choose a different option, they might offer an incentive like, say, $20,000 off the sticker price. So right there is the interest, essentially, that they're kind of baking in. So just be cautious when you're looking at these low interest rate deals on new vehicles. On used vehicles, interest rates typically are not that low. And actually, if we look uh, online, I've got uh, cardealcanada.ca um, has the average length of loans. And then also we have an article here on the actual um, average interest rate on car loans. So the average rate I see on multiple sites here in Canada, we have like 7.25 in March 2023. In June 2024, 7.59 was the average Um Another site says 8.09%. Of course, these are various people with different credit scores and so forth. So typically, if you're buying a used car or you're buying a new car that doesn't have any sort of low interest promotion, you're going to be paying a decent chunk in interest on this loan. So you have to really start thinking about how do we want to fund this thing? Now, some people might have the approach of, hey, I'm going to just, you know, sock away money and then throw a bunch of money down on this car. 
that's not a, you know very fun, but also paying 7% might not be very fun either. So what we're gonna actually look at here today is we're going to actually explore some options around financing. Now, some people, like myself, have used home equity lines of credit in order to purchase cars in the past. And why I like that option, and it might be an option that you consider this next time around, it's less about the interest rate because on your home equity line of credit, you're probably going to be paying prime plus 0.5 or prime plus 1%. That would put that at about 6.95% right now if we think about today's current prime rate at 6.45 as I record this. Uh, or if it's plus 1%, you're talking 7.45%. And of course, in months prior to this recording, those numbers would have even been higher before the Bank of Canada began cutting rates. It's not so much about the rate that I'm concerned about. It's about the flexibility that I like with the home equity line of credit. Because as money comes into my bank account, I can actually commit to a certain payment amount. Ideally, it would be the payment that you would get from, say, a dealer or a bank or whoever's financing the car, and you'd actually pay that much or more. So a good habit with your home equity line of credit might be to actually make that same payment if it's eight fifty a month or whatever it is, you automatically have eight fifty a month coming out on the first of the month. Even better, you can split it up and say every Monday or every Friday have it come out. You know, uh, about a fourth of that amount coming out every time. But the part I really like is that if there's extra money sitting in your bank account and you don't have a use for it at that time, but you don't necessarily want to put it into investments or lock it up in anything, you could take that money and you can just push it onto the home equity line of credit, sort of like the Manulife One approach to uh, living. And basically what that will do is it'll just save on interest, right? Because they're calculating interest each day. They're not compounding it daily, but they are calculating how much interest based on the balance each day. And if you can throw an extra three grand on it, even if it's for two weeks before you have to pay the credit card bill, that's going to save some interest and that's going to add up. So that's a great strategy if you you want to pay that car off and you want to, you know, essentially try to, you know, pay less interest as you go and maybe pay off that car much sooner than you had initially planned if you were going to the dealer or a bank for a loan. Now, the other option I want you to be considering is something, if you think back to our episode on building an emergency fund, all right, you'll note that in that episode on building and supercharging your emergency fund, we propose the idea of utilizing a permanent insurance policy, specifically a high early cash value life insurance policy as a decent place to dump your emergency funds. Now, some people are going to argue that, well, listen, in the first year, there's a little bit of opportunity cost, so maybe that's not the best spot for an emergency fund. I'm going to argue that most emergency funds are there, and hopefully we aren't going to use them. So what we want them to do is we want them to grow, and if we can get them growing at a nice rate consistently, that would be better than having to rely on a high interest rate environment like we've been in for a high yield savings account to, to sort of make sense. So my thought here is imagine a world where you've been funding your emergency fund for a number of years, maybe it's four or so years, six years, something like that, where you finally have a decent chunk of emergency fund, and then it's time to buy that car, you can actually leverage against that policy in order to make the car purchase. The beauty is, is that this would act much like a home equity line of credit in that you get to decide what the repayment terms are. There is a set interest rate based on the insurer, whichever insurer you're working with. All right, we have our thoughts on which insurers are, are better than, than some other companies for both the policy growth, but also for the lower policy interest rate loans. Um, when you do that, you're able to take that money put it on the car and start making your payments back to the policy much like you would with a car loan or if it was a home equity line of credit that you're using to purchase this vehicle. The part I really like is that because you had already been funding this policy for years prior, you could actually consider offsetting the policy if this was your emergency fund policy and the policy is going to continue to grow and compound whether you take a loan against it or not. So it acts like a big bucket of cash 
cash that you'll be loaning against. So instead of taking the loan against the vehicle, you're taking the loan against the policy. Now, easy answers here. Some people are going to say, well, what if the interest rate is better that's being offered by a bank, for example? If it's not affecting the car price in a negative manner, meaning the car price is the same whether you go to that bank or not, and the and the actual interest rate is lower than what you could get on a policy loan, then of course, go that route. Why? Two reasons. I get to keep my emergency fund bucket of cash available for other opportunities and other expenses or potentially emergencies in the future while it continues to grow. And I'm going to leverage against the vehicle at a lower interest rate, right? Easy, easy stuff. But the real question becomes, well, what if it's the same interest rate? And what I wanted to share with you today is actually a little uh, summary that I did here in a spreadsheet for you, looking at a direct comparison. And when we actually look at, when we look at it, we're going to use six, uh, 6 6.5% as the rate. Because right now, one of the insurers that we often utilize, especially for this type of high early cash value policy, their interest rate for their policy loans is 6.5%. But they do something differently with policy loans that they don't do with car loans. And that is that at, it's only compounded at the end of the year. That means that throughout the year, they're tabulating how much interest is owed on each day of all 365 days throughout the year, but they don't actually capitalize it to the loan. That means they actually tally it to the side and only at the end of the year do they add the interest owing to the loan balance. So that puts you in the driver's seat to be taking whatever payment you were going to make on, say, a traditional loan payment, and you can put it down on the policy loan, which means that you'll be borrowing less money throughout that year and throughout every year until the end of the year when the interest is applied and then your next payment is there to sort of knock it back down. So what you're going to see here for those who are on YouTube, you're going to see a comparison here in these blue columns where we have the same $50,000 we're borrowing for this car, all right? And we have a six-year loan. That's about the average length uh, most commonly uh, used for car loans currently. It seems like they're getting like longer and longer for brand new cars, that is, anyway. But here we're going to use 72 months. And if it's a traditional loan, you're looking at that 650 requiring $840.50 for car payments each month for those six years. That's 72 months. So what you're going to see in these two columns, for those who go on YouTube and they check out this video, you'll be able to actually see the numbers. You'll see the interest we're paying to the side. And basically what's happening is the interest and the principal are being paid down, much like we do on a mortgage. They're being blended and you're paying this thing down. And by the end of the six years, you're going to have no balance and obviously the last of your interest to pay off. Over that seven or sorry, six year period, 72 months, with a traditional loan, you're looking to pay $10,515. When we look to the policy loan and we think about how they apply the interest, and in that the interest is tabulated for 12 months and then put on at the end of the year, so they call that capitalizing it. They, a lot of people get this wrong and they say it's simple interest. It's not simple interest. It's they compound it at the end of the year. They, they capitalize it at the end of the year. So what's happening in the first 12 months is you're actually taking those $840.50 and you're actually hacking down the amount owing or what you'd call the principal of this loan. You're actually hacking that down. So you actually are paying less interest. It's not substantially less because $50,000 isn't a massive amount of money, but you can see here that this effect over time and the longer you go, the more this effect would have a positive impact. So by doing that and by waiting to apply the interest after or at the end of the year, you'll notice that, hey, my loan owing 
in this last month of the year was about 40,000. All of a sudden it jumps to 42,000. That's because the interest has been applied. Now we keep paying down that 840 and 50 cents each month. It takes about two months to get that, that, you know, interest payment off the books. And then all of a sudden we're back to saving more interest again. And by the end of these 72 months or this six year period, the interest that has been paid on the policy loan. So remember, we're keeping the same interest rate, 6.5%, but the way that the interest is capitalized in the policy loan has saved you about $500. Now, for a lot of people, they say that's not that much money. And you're right, it's not that much money. But when you think $500, when you're paying about $10,000, you're looking at about a 5% savings on the interest that you paid. So that is, that does matter, you know, for people who say it doesn't matter. Well, that's the same thing as saying, well, then I guess the interest rate being a little higher, a little lower doesn't really matter. Well, no, it does matter. How it's being applied and how it's being capitalized is really important in this particular case. Now, in this particular case with this policy loan, what I did in the background is I actually ran this policy, and for those who are with me, they can see here, and we actually funded this policy with the same $840.50 per month, which is about $10,000 per year, and we had done that for the six years prior. Why? Well, I wanted to keep this similar to what we're funding for the car. So if you can imagine that, it's like you're funding this car for six years, the first six years here. But remember, we're not funding a car. We're funding an emergency fund in this particular case. That would be how I would play it. Because again, I would never set up a policy just for auto loans, right? That's not in in my world that that doesn't, you know, that's not going to tabulate. But if you were creating an emergency fund anyway, you've now capitalized a nice emergency fund and you might choose to then start leveraging that emergency fund. Now, in this particular case, we've actually offset the premiums after year six. That means we're not going to put another dollar into this policy for the rest of our life, but we're going to keep this policy for the rest of our life. That means the cash value is going to continue growing, even though I'm not going to put any more money in it. It's my emergency fund, but it's also acting now like a bit of an opportunity bucket or a bit of a car loan bucket in this particular case. So what I wanted to show you is that actually the cash value that we were borrowing against after 10 years or sorry, six years of funding, about $10,000 has a cash value of about $64,000. We leveraged $50,000 of that $64,000. And while we're paying that loan off, remember, we're no longer paying into the policy. So we were paying the policy for first six years, offset it, and now we're making the payments back to the policy for the policy loan to fund this vehicle. And what you're going to see is two things happening. Not only are we paying down the car, just like you would with a traditional loan that we saw, not only, even though the the interest rate is the same amount, 6.5% for both. So we're going to save about $500 or about 5% of the interest that uh, that we had paid over time. But you're also going to notice that the total cash value of this policy is actually growing in the background. I'm just going to slide over here for you to see that. You'll see it was 64,000. At the end of the first year of car payments, the policy loan, the policy cash value is worth about sixty-seven thousand six hundred and twenty-eight dollars, and you've actually paid back about ten thousand dollars of that car loan. So that means that you're getting not only more cash value growth, but you're also getting more loan availability again because every year you're paying back to this policy to pay off the money borrowed for the vehicle. So what you're going to actually see by the end of six years is that this policy, even though we stopped funding it before we took the policy loan for this vehicle, we stopped funding the policy and it just kept growing on its own. The policy itself has a cash value of $86,000, almost $87,000, and we fully paid off the vehicle. So what we've done here is by essentially funding this policy 
again, not to make it a car loan policy, but to make it more of an emergency fund, to make it, we'll call it your fixed income bucket, right? Whatever portion of your investments are in fixed incomes, you can consider this bucket to be that portion. And now we're able to leverage against it to put it to use, especially if we're in a higher interest rate environment. If you cannot get a lower interest rate on the actual car loan uh, from a bank or from the actual dealer, you might have to turn to something like your home equity line of credit, like you'll see on the screen right now. And if we were to borrow against our home equity line of credit today, my home equity line of credit is prime plus 0.1%, which is 7.45%. That number can go up or it can go down. We're anticipating them to come down in the next little while, but right now it's higher. And if we actually ran this scenario out and kept this compared to 6.5% like it is for the policy loan, you're going to see that you're actually saving much more. You're also going to pay off the car earlier if you make the same payments you were making for this. The payments have gone up for the 7.45%. It would go up to about 863 uh, per month. If we apply that same 863 to a policy loan, it's going to pay off the car by month 68 or by the end of month 68, whereas the other policy or the other loan is going to uh, be going for 72 full months. And your actual interest savings is going to be about $2,400. And of course, when you're paying $12,000 compared to $9,700, that $2,400 represents a significant, a significant amount of interest in savings on this $50,000 that we're discussing here today. So why I'm sharing this with you is so that you can see that sometimes how we approach, how we finance things, specifically things like vehicles that are depreciating, uh, you know, I don't even like to call them assets because they just depreciate their, their expenses and they go down in value. Um, of course, they have some value, but they keep going down in value over time. We need them. We need to fund them. So finding ways that we can creatively fund them can be really helpful. And for me, if I have an opportunity bucket growing. In this case, we're looking at permanent insurance, high cash value permanent insurance. We're able to use that bucket if it makes sense at the time. By no means am I suggesting that you should do this. You should be looking at what makes the most sense and what is going to be best for you and your financial future. So hopefully this has been a helpful little add to your uh, you know, wealth arsenal. Um, if you are car shopping, uh, please try to buy something that's uh, you know, used and, and not, going to, you know, not going to waste away too, too much money. But on the other hand, if cars are your thing and that's what you've been working towards, of course, have at her, enjoy it, but let's just be smart about how we're gonna finance these things and if we can be careful and we can be selective in how we're gonna finance these cars and these vehicles, we can actually help ourselves in our wealth journey at the very same time. So that's your wealth secret for this week. Hopefully you found it helpful. If you're interested in considering a permanent life insurance policy with a high cash value to utilize for a fixed income portion of your portfolio, to leverage as a tool for opportunities for other investments or asset classes, definitely consider reaching out to us at CanadianWealthSecrets.com forward slash discovery for a quick discovery call where we can run your scenario and see if something like that does make sense for your situation. Once again, reach out to CanadianWealthSecrets.com forward slash discovery. And I look forward to chatting with you soon.